Frederick, since I don't have a headphones and I don't know French, I have to ask you a first question in English and then hopefully we'll get this sorted. So the first question I want to ask you is basically the question you wanted me to ask you. And, it, and it's, do you feel safe in Poland? Because you know, some of the things you have said in your interviews recently is, I believe, quite illegal here. And the way you criticize religion and the way you grapple with Catholic Church abuses is pretty straightforward. So I wanted to ask you what's your mission behind it? And do you feel you're unlike church in what you're doing? Um, so, bonjour. <laughs> I'm. Um... I didn't ask you the question to ask you a question to ask me a question about uh, how that if I feel secure here. I feel very secure. I just um, I just need to eat something because I didn't eat since <laughs> breakfast this morning. But that's not really a question of safety. Uh, to be more serious and to answer a, a, a real question, um, the question is: Can you criticize the church? Are you allowed to criticize the church? Is it a, a problem when you criticize the church? And I never said anything that is illegal. Illegal in France, illegal in Italy, illegal in Poland or anywhere else. I'm French and I come from a country where religion is protected. You have the right to believe. And that's extremely important. The French Constitution, especially with one article that is constitutionalized, allowed anybody to believe, anybody to have the face of his choice or her choice. You are protected by the government, by the Constitution to believe. Article number one. Number one. And at the same time, there is another article, article number two, that says you also have the right not to believe. The article second also says that you can and you have to separate very strictly, very strictly, politics and government in one side and religion in the other side. So, yes, you have the right to believe, but you also have the same right to criticize religion. And it has been the case for centuries, at least since the French Revolution. It is before Rousseau, it is Voltaire, it is Rimbaud, it is Victor Hugo. You have the right to believe and you have the right to criticize the church. And I would say the confusion the collusion between politics and the Catholic Church, for example, it's not possible as a principle, no matter why, no matter what. And uh, it's a way to answer your question that, you know, in some countries, I don't know, with people named uh, Kaczynski or something else, they believe Catholicism is part of the right and the definition of a country. I don't think it should be the case. I think no country can be really democratic if the political sphere and the religious sphere are mixed up. And I will add in addition, you cannot criticize the church because if you criticize the church, you also criticize LGBT people because the church from priest to cardinal and bishop is mainly gay. So I would say basically don't criticize LGBT people because otherwise you criticize Catholic Church. Don't criticize Catholic Church otherwise you will criticize LGBT people. Frederick. <laughs> You've earned two rounds of applause already. Congratulations on that. But it wasn't so easy always. 
During the first visit in Poland, recently, when you were promoting the, the book, I have a quote here. You said, in reply to Professor Obilek, that even though you don't know any, everything about church, you do know a lot about gayness. And when you, when you do know a lot about gayness, you do understand church, because you cannot understand one without the other. Would you care to elaborate on that? Why do we have to understand gayness to understand modern church? Why do you say that, then? Yes, I was a bit provocative in the introduction. Uh, I want to try to be more serious now. And uh, I'm a sociologist, I'm an academic, I'm also a journalist. And uh, I believe, I, you know, for those who don't necessarily know that, my book is a book of the history of the church since Paul VI and with the, the role that played the gay, the homosexual issue within the church history. And I show that the majority of the bishops and uh, assistants and cardinals around Paul VI, but also John Paul II, also Benedict XVI, were gay. Either homophile without practicing, or gay active people with lovers. Many cardinals around John Paul II had lovers, sometimes also prostitutes, and many other, um, um, you know, elements. Why is that? It's not, it's not polemics. It's not just to say, look at this guy, he's gay. You know, I'm openly gay. I, I'm totally happy if a cardinal or a bishop is gay. I think it should be one part of life, and it's a reality. So that's not a critique. What is a critique? What my book is about? It's about hypocrisy. It's about schizophrenia. It's about cardinals and bishops that everywhere in the world they say to people, you cannot have sex before marriage. You cannot divorce. If you divorce, you're going to go to hell. You cannot be gay, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, themselves spend their life to be gay, and quite often also to protect pedophile. That's the debate. But that's not a question of who they are. I never out people. I'm not attacking this guy. The question is not about Cardinal A being gay, or Cardinal B or Bishop C being gay. The question is about a system. And then you go to sociology. When you are 20 years old, in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, in a little village here in Poland, or in a big city like this one, or Warsaw, or Krakow, and you discover you're gay, your life will be a nightmare. People are already making fun of you because of your voice because of your clothes, because of your way of life, because you say, I don't want to be married, I don't like girls. And if you're from a bourgeois family, it will be a shame of your family. If you are poor, your life will be terrible. Becoming a priest was the solution. When you become a priest, and you're gay, and they say, be careful, if you're a priest, you cannot marry with a woman. You're very happy. That's what you want. In addition, you can have your clothes you want. Be dressed like a woman, and look at Cardinal, uh, I'm not going to mention this one, or Cardinal, I'm not going to mention this one. Oh, your voice is a bit too, you know. That's fine, you can sing in the church. And your mum, who understand, understood everything. She's so happy by this mysterious and wonderful vocation that suddenly makes you priest. I mean, I make a bit fun here, but what I'm telling you, I'm sure, 100%, that's the story of the vast majority of priests, bishops, and cardinals, even here in Poland. That's the reality. So that's a sociology, why the church, from the beginning, recruited, identified, and promoted mainly homosexual people. And I want to say, that's fine. If they take pure, non-sexual people, 
quite often it ended up with sexual abuse. If they take straight people, they leave the church. They left by thousands in the 70s. And if you take people that say, I'm really chaste, I'm not going to have sex, it is in general people that already are in trouble. It's a pathology because chastity is counter-natural. You need to understand that chastity doesn't work. Chastity is not actually working at all. And I spent four years doing this book. I met hundreds of priests, dozens of bishops, more than 42 cardinals. I lived inside the Vatican. I was in party every night, dinners, and the cardinal, the assistant, come to my place, inside the Vatican, with my bishop or my cardinal. I look at them. We were in a gay club. We were in gay dinners. And the reality is that everybody knows that. Every Vaticanist knows that. And even the Pope spoke about my book saying, I read it, it is good, I knew everything. That's why I call it Sodoma. When did he say so? When did he say so? He said that it was not a statement, it was a, a, a conversation with a very famous, um, I mean the name is not public, but a very famous, let's say, uh, defender or lawyer in abuse, sexual abuse, and uh, the guy confirmed that to the press, and it's, if you put that in the internet, it has been in many newspapers in Latin America, and also in the US, where they confirm and they double check the, the, the statement, and the guy is, of course, very close to the Pope. But a lot of them told me that. I mean, one of the most famous advisors and known of the Pope, when he read the book, he said, you know, that's just unbelievable. We understand all the people that right now are opponents of Pope Francis because they are very homophobic, they attack the Pope because he's too gay friendly and they are themselves gay. That's the story of the pontificate. This gay cardinal closeted attack the Pope with straight because he's gay friendly when they are the gay one. That's the story of today, Pope Francis War. Okay, let me be the devil's advocate for a moment, okay? The devil only, I guess. <laughs> Can you presume for a moment it is not because they are gay themselves they do not agree with Pope Francis? No, you, you're right. There is many reasons why you can uh, fight against Francis. And to tell you the truth, I was not a very big um, advocate of Francis. When I became, when I began my, my my book, my research, why? Because I'm French. You know, he's from Argentina. He's a Peronist, Jesuit. You know the story between France and Jesuit. So we cannot trust a Jesuit, never. <laughs> and in addition, he's 82 years old. One day he's gay friendly. The day after, he's anti-gay. It's very difficult to trust him. And I didn't trust him. I thought he was too old, too conservative on family issue, even though he's very progressive on migrants, um, social issue, let's say also on the environmental issue. So I had mixed feelings about this Pope. But what I just said, you understand the attacks against Francis. All the people that are anti-migrants, like in this country, they hate Pope Francis. All the people who don't understand poverty and why you need to give power, empowerment to poor people. They don't like Pope Francis. When you are gay friendly, Pope Francis is maybe not the best and he's not so gay friendly, but in comparison with Paul VI, Jean Paul II and Benedict XVI, he's much more friendly so in comparison it's better and by definition if you're homophobic you don't like Pope Francis and if you try to be moderate on China on Cuba on Venezuela I mean I'm not in favor of these three regimes I'm totally anti-communist and totally anti-leftist you know hard leftist I'm against I think Venezuela should change the regime and authorize democracy the same for Cuba and of course, to some extent, to China and, and Russia. 
at the same time you need also to be smart in diplomacy and francis is and these right wing cardinals and media are against francis because of all this issue and so you you right uh, homosexuality is not the only one i think it was one of the key the fight against francis the war against francis began in 2014 and 2015 really because of the synod of the family when francis tried to be more more in favor of divorce to some extent and a bit gay friendly on homosexual issue the fight began that moment so homosexuality played a key role on the overall fight and once again you might not trust me but i'm sure 100 percent that the majority of the cardinal like the dubia and many others that attack francis on the synod of family because it's too gay friendly are themselves okay and what if somebody really doesn't trust you have you been sued so far over your book no sue no not even a letter to say you need to change something why because they know that it's true why because everybody knows that i mean the vaticanese the priests the people living in the vatican they know that this, this is one of the biggest story of the last 50 years and to tell you the truth this book wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Why is that? Because, you know, the, the church, like it is to some extent in Poland, was something you cannot criticize. And if this book would have been done by a Vaticanist, he would have lost his job. If this book would have been done by an Italian, it would have been difficult because even in Italy today, publisher, are not, it's not easy for them. And if this book would have been done by a straight journalist, it would have been possible because he would have, wouldn't have had the code, he wouldn't have the network to understand the, the, the story. This is why this book is done by a, a French non-Vaticanist and a French journalist that has the code. But at the same time, I would say, people were ready to, to listen. When my book was published, one day before, Cardinal McCarrick was basically denounced for sexual abuse. One day after, the Nuncio in Paris, Luigi Ventura, was basically denounced by more than 10 kids that have been aggressed, not exactly abused, but touched and you know, harassed sexually by him. A few days after, Cardinal Pell went to jail. A few days after, Cardinal Barbarin was, was, uh, was uh, felt guilty by a, supreme, uh, by a court in France for protecting sexual abuse, and so on and so on. Uh, Cardinal Erasuriz was, uh, is now under investigation in Chile. Cardinal Esato is also, Esati is also under investigation, and so on and so forth. So when the book was published, Sodoma, in, uh, on 21st of February, uh, a few months ago, the church was basically destroyed everywhere. And homosexuality was the key explanation of all of that. You know, when the book was out in Chile, we sold 20,000 copies immediately because of that. The same here. I mean, I don't want to do a promotion, but the book is already more than 60,000 copies here in Poland, which is totally extreme for a French book on the Vatican, you know? But why? Because for so long, the church, that is an organization of lie. It's not an organization of truth. Cardinals, especially some I know here, Polish cardinals, are always speaking about truth. But they always lie. They lie on everything. And so they lie for so long that suddenly when somebody arrives with a very serious research about 600 pages and give you all the information, you just read, because they told you for so long that it's, it's, it's budget what, what they were say, telling and telling.
And that was the same in the US, we were New York Times bestseller, the same in Colombia, the same in actually even in Argentina and Canada and Netherlands. And the book is translated already or will be more than 25 languages. So, Frederick, I'm going to make this a little harder for you, if you don't mind. I'm not afraid. Because from what you're saying, one might assume that the church is crumbling, the church is under siege, and so on and so on. But we are talking in Poland, where anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-trans people sentiment today is at its peak. And the more church is being criticized, the bigger anti-LGBT backlash there is here. And, and what? So the, the, the only, I mean, the only job of a journalist and a writer, our job is very simple. We are not judges. We are not politicians. We are just doing good books with facts, stories, and to try to explain the reality. If some politician, even when they are a single man with a cat, wants to attack LGBT people because they might have some trouble in their own life and, and use LGBT people as a, a symbol of their attacks to be elected by populism, our job and the only things we can do is just to explain that. The rule is very simple. It doesn't work all the time, but it works, I would say, 90% of the case. Whenever you, are, you listen a cardinal, whenever you listen a politician, whenever you listen a journalist that is very homophobic, in the majority of the case, is himself gay. Repressed gay. He hates himself. He hates himself and this is why he hates others. When I spoke with Cardinal Walter Casper, a German Cardinal in the Vatican, when I met Cardinal Omela Omela in Barcelona, when I met Matteo Zucchi, who just became Cardinal a few days ago, and I saw the three of them, all of them, we discussed the gay issue. They said, okay, I might, I might disagree with you, I might be not in favor of gay marriage. We had a normal conversation. They have the right to think differently than me. They might be against, they, they have the right to be against gay marriage. I'm in favor, but they can be against. We were with normal people. We, we had a normal discussion. They didn't go to the street to attack gay people in an incredible way, like if the worst thing in the world today is not terrorism, is not radical Islam, is not uh, the environmental destruction of the planet. It's gay people. No. They never said that. They were normal people you discuss with. And so I'm pretty sure, even though I don't know anything about their private life, that Cardinal Omela Omela, Cardinal Walter Casper, Cardinal, Cardinal Matteo, Matteo Zuppi are straight. Because that's not a big issue for them. But when you see a cardinal or a politician that is obsessed, for him the worst things in the world today, the most important issue is LGBT rights. When they think gay marriage is worst, than the way the planet is going or, or the way terrorism can destroy you. And some, even some cardinal make the, the comparison that LGBT rights is the same as Islamic terrorism. Then you think they have a problem in their own life. So that's our job just to explain that. You yourself said that she has some interesting friends earlier. And I mean Steve Bannon, chief advisor to President Trump. Former. Well, yes, precisely, he was... He was fired. He was fired. I was going to say deposed, but yeah, he was fired. Don't you think that some people use these emotions just for political gain, just cynically, just that, not out of spite, but because it's a way to profit politically? First of all, uh, you know, in this, uh, since the book was published, we got, uh, honestly, thousands of articles 
a lot were against me, a lot were in favor of me, a lot were also uh, in between. So I had people that, I mean, president, prime minister, very famous people like Steve Bannon that said my book is wonderful and they love it. From the right, from the left, mainly from the, the left actually, uh, and I'm, let's say, more moderate, uh, liberal, um, moderate left guy. Steve Bannon is very interesting. He called me one night and said, I read your book, I love it, and I want to invite you for lunch. I'm a journalist, I go, always. Whoever is the best. If Marine Le Pen invited me to lunch, I would go. I mean, she didn't, but... <laughs> and we had a discussion, and he said to me, what I'm telling you has been published in newspaper, and he knows that the story is out. So I'm not against, uh, I'm not betraying him. He said very simple things. He said, okay, I read your book. You said in your book that 80% of the priests and people working and cardinal in the Vatican are gay. I said to Steve Bannon, no, I didn't, I never said that, by the way. It's a priest that I quote that say that, but I didn't say that. He said, okay, okay, but you say 80%. I said, I didn't, whatever. He said, okay, I call my guy in Rome. Probably his guy was the journalist head of his newspaper. And I said, this French guy, Martel, wrote a book and he says that 80% of the priests are gay. My, my friend says, Ben Bannon, said, no, Martel is wrong. It's, it is not true that 80% of the priests and cardinals in the Vatican are gay. It's 90%. So I said, okay, then what are you going to do? He said, that's not an issue, because if they are very gay, and I said, but your own people in the Vatican, the cardinal, your friend with, the bishop, your friend with, and he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? That they might be, he stopped me, he said, gay? I said, baby! And then he looked at me, he said, yes, I know. So if it's the case, I said to him, the church is in the dead end. If, if there are so many being gay, it's a dead end when you're so homophobic. He said, I agree. So we need to stop the fight against gay people, we need to allow priests to become gay, to married with women if they want, and move on to other issues. And we agree on that. Then of course, other issue for him means fighting against immigration, against China, uh, against whatever. And we disagree on all the other topics. But I had this kind of conversation with many people, even with Cardinal, even with very famous Vaticanists, even with advisor of the Pope, Everybody knows that first, chastity failed. Second of all, that the church, because of celibacy, became homosexualized. Third, the fact that they lie on their sexuality has a lot of consequence in terms of scandals, in terms of lie, in terms of not true statement, and in, train, in terms of abuse. I'm going to go back on that because it's important. Fourth, it cannot work anymore. Because we are in 2019. Today, there is phone, there is camera, there is tape recorder, there is victims that go to the media, and media that publish the statement of the victim. So everything will be out, and the secrets of the church are not going to be secret anymore. So that's the dead end. This is why I am and I became a big supporter of Pope Francis because he understands the reality and he wants to move on. He wants to change the situation. This is why next month in the Synod of Amazonia he is going to try to allow some old men that are married to be allowed to be priests. It will give more power to women, and it will also allow, it's a bit technical, but in a para parish or in an episcopate, it has to be run by, by a priest. Now he says we can separate the, 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 the priest that gives, that 
gives a characteristic to the one that run the parish or the of the episcopate. And the second one can be not priest. So there are the three main issues at stake that will be discussed in October in the Vatican and it's going to be a big uh, debate during this Amazonian uh, synod. By the way, Francis is very smart. He used the indigenous people in the um, Amazonia to try, the periphery to try to change the center. That's smart. But he might have a very strong, uh, he might have a lot of attacks because of that. I just want to make a small point on sexual abuse. I've, I've followed the situation here, the film, the, 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 the film in the theater, the film on the internet, the scandals, and uh, I, I, I want to try to explain what's happening in, in this issue, even though the issue is very complex. First of all, there is no link at all between homosexuality and sexual abuse. We know very well by many statistics that if you take the overall story of the sexual abuse around the world, the abuser is mainly a man and the victim is mainly a woman or a girl. Everywhere in the world, sexual abuse are straight. They are heterosexual. And for a very simple reason, you have much more straight people than gay people. Second of all, if you look now only in the Catholic Church, and you look at the statistics we have about abuse, you will see that the victims are from 80 to 85 percent, depending on studies, underage boy or young man. Quite often seminarian, by the way, also. It means in the sexual abuse crisis overall, it's mainly heterosexual, but in the church, it is the abuse are mainly homosexual. Why is that? The problem is not homosexuality. The problem is a repression on sexuality. The problem is, is you, you hate your own sexuality. You hate what you are. You're repressed because of chastity that you don't act if, until you act and then it's an abuse. And you always abuse kids or for example migrants or seminarians because they are vulnerable. A kid is not supposed to speak. We never seen any migrants that are basically the prostitute they use in Rome going to the police station and say, oh, I'm an illegal migrant and I've been abused by a priest. They don't go to see the police. And the seminarians are under the power of the priest or the bishops or the nuncio whatever. So, the reason is mainly this hate of yourself and the hate of the sexuality. But there is something more, which is terrible. In the majority of abuse, if the church knows and you stop it, it's finished. If Marcel Maciel, the multiple pedophile in Mexico, have been stopped after the first statement, the first uh, dossier, that was, that, was, that was sent to the Vatican immediately, the Marcel, Marcel story wouldn't exist because he would have been arrested or he, he would have been fired of the church, he would have been, um, maybe doctors would have tried to take care of him. The same with Caradima story in Chile, the same with Grower in Austria, the same with the Bernard Law system in Boston, the same with O'Brien in Ireland, the same in everywhere, here, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France, and so on and so forth. The main question of the sexual abuse after the problem of the abuser himself, it's the problem of the cover-up. And the cover-up, it's always bishops that protect priests, priests that protect uh, the priest, nuncio, the famous diplomats, the ambassador of the Pope, that protect priests cardinal that protect bishops or priests. And why they do that? For many reasons. First of all, for clericalism. 
they protect the institution and not the people. Second of all, because a lot of them have themselves problems. They might have a girlfriend, they might be gay, they might have lovers. And when you are bishops and you have a girlfriend, or when you are bishops and you have a boyfriend, or you use prostitute a bit too much, and you are in front of a priest from your own parish, or your own episcopate, that committed abuse, you say, what did you do? And the guy will answer you very simply. You know, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have touched the kid. Really, it's a mistake. I'm bad. But you understand me. You live with Carlo. And then it's finished. The bishop cannot do anything against the priest. And what I'm telling you, it's, it seems incredible. We know by the hundred and thousand of files that me and my team of 80 people around the world, we look at all the cases, and we find that quite often blackmail of the bishops are part of the reason why the bishop protected the priest. And in the, in, in the big story of Martial Maciel, that actually has a lot of links with Poland, we know that he, 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 he blackmailed people. We know that he paid a lot of money to many bishops and cardinals to be protected. So, to finish, at the core of the sexual abuse scandals and the core of the cover-up, you also have the problem of the sexuality of the bishops and the cardinals. Frederick. Why did you say you are not going to write another book on church? Because, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a Catholic myself. I was Catholic uh, under, until I was uh, 12 years old or 13 years old. Um, I'm not a specialist about the church, even though I'm a bit, uh, to some extent, uh, now. Uh, but, you know, I have other things to do. I'm, I'm working on politics, I'm working on my, my own field, my PhD one on uh, uh, in social science, mainly on culture, communication, media, internet. So I need to go back to my regular field. And also to tell you the truth, and I'm not joking, it's a bit more difficult for me now to do some research in the Vatican. You know, before it was so easy. Um, please don't coach me, and there is no camera, I'm sure, and you're not going to tell that to anyone. But you know, when I arrive in the Vatican, um, you know, I'm 50 years old, so I'm not so young anymore. And you know, when I go to bars and clubs, that's not so easy. When I arrive in the Vatican, it was so easy. They all like me, because even though I'm still, uh, you know, I'm not so young anymore, and I'm, I'm not as beautiful as you, uh, I'm still 30 years younger than them. <laughs> so, it was easy. They invite me a lot. I went to vacation, a weekend with them in their house. And, and so, I never had, by the way, any lovers that was a priest or a bishop or cardinal. But, you know, we were friends. And um, so, just, I, I need to move on to other subjects. And you know, I'm not against the church, that's not the fight of my life. I did my research, I did my book, I think it is serious, I think it is right. You might like it, you might not like it. I've done my homework. Now, journalists from Poland have to do their own job. And there is a lot to say about what's going on in the Sodoma church in Poland. A lot, even in Krakow, even in this city here. But, you know, I cannot do the job myself everywhere. So I've done my homework, now the journalists have to do their own in Poland, in France, in UK, in Italy. And also, um, priests and the Vatican, they have to do their own work themselves. They need to look on the facts and reality. And, you know, what I'm fighting for, if I fight for something, is just to take in account the reality. 
if you know when you go to Mexico, when you go to and I've done that many times, when you go to Bolivia, when you go to Brazil, when you go to Ecuador, whenever you look at the statistics, the report, you ask priests and bishops, and even the official report to the Vatican, they told you that every priest, or in Africa, every priest in little villages have a girlfriend. And whenever you go to a big city, they have a boyfriend. So the story is very clear. Heterosexuality actively in rural countries, in rural Bolivia, Mexico, Africa, and homosexual, homosexuality in urban area. If it's true, then they lie. They lie to everybody. They told for decades to millions of people to do things that are forbidden, they do themselves the same thing. So I think reality has just to be taken in account. You look at how the priests live, and I don't blame them for that. I'm totally fine if a priest has a girlfriend, or if a priest has a boyfriend, until he's adult and with consent. That's the only thing. And all the people that don't accept that a priest has a girlfriend, adult girlfriend, or an adult boyfriend, are in fact now an ally on the abuse crisis. Frederick, we are closing in on time, but I wouldn't leave you, I wouldn't leave us, without you telling this wonderful anecdote when you met Stanisław Dziwisz. And I want you to give us some last words about what do you wish for church globally, and what do you wish for church in Poland. You know, Stanislaw, it's difficult to say for me. Um, he never answer any emails. He never answer any request by me, and actually he never answer nobody, uh, journalists and so on. So I went, I went to Krakow. I look at his door, and it was a bit surprising because the guy that opened the door didn't speak. One word, I know who he is, but I'm not going to give you the name, that didn't know anything about French or English or whatever. So I was like trying to explain I want to meet the cardinal, and the other one didn't get anything. And suddenly he looked at me and he said, Do you want to, a kind of expression I understood, do you want to pay tribute to the cardinal? I said, Yes, yes, I want. He closed the door, and after Two, three, four minutes, I don't know. He opened again and said, the cardinal is going to meet you. I enter, I sit, I wait. The door was open, Cardinal Zivic arrived. He looked at me. And he invited me to come. And we spoke. Things might be secret, so I'm not going to tell you everything. And so we spoke for a long moment, he said, you know, many things. And then he said, you know, that's very bad. I need to leave you because there is a old bad man that has an appointment with me. Do you want to come back tomorrow to see me? I said, yes, of course. So the day after I arrived, so second meetings, he was waiting for me. I gave him a present, he gave me free presents and so on and so forth. So that's it was just my meeting with him, was very nice. Then in a, and it, of course he's recorded. And then in a statement that nobody saw actually, he said, I never met this guy. And he said in addition that um, he doesn't speak French, which he, he speaks perfectly. So this one, or Cardinal Muller, or Cardinal Sara, or Cardinal Bram Muller, or Cardinal Mesmer, or Cardinal Cafara, or Cardinal Sara, can give you a lot of names. If they can lie on little things like that, very little things, because that's so easy to say, yes, I met him, we exchanged present, he was nice, that's it. If they can lie on things so little, they can lie on everything. They can lie about what they did, and he's the most important assistant of John Paul II. He might have lied to the Pope. 
he knew a lot of things about the scandal of Cara Dima in Chile, the scandal of Marcel Maciel in Mexico, the scandal of Groer in Austria, and so on and so forth. He might have lied, he might have lied to the Pope. He might have lied to us about politics, about money, about his personal life, about many other things. And so, if the church wants to survive, they need to stop speaking all the time, all the time about saying the truth, to begin just to say the truth. Szanowni Państwo, Frederik Martel.